Greetings once again, Elam friends and those who are visiting. However you found us on uh, YouTube or on our website or wherever, we're grateful that you joined us, taking a little time to be with us today as we worship in this Epiphany season. Wow, what a season we are going through, right? We have had a momentous week just past. Regardless of your feelings politically, uh, we have to say, the fact that our country is able to move forward and do so in a basically peaceful way is a real gift and a blessing for which we give our thanks today. I'm grateful that you are here with us today. I'm grateful that you have come to spend some time to pray, to think about um, what it is that God is up to in our world, what God is up to in your life. We're talking about trans Transformation. Transformation is a word that gets used a great deal, maybe too much. But we're talking about the fact that we celebrated Christmas where Jesus, we're told, is God in human flesh, come among us to be with us. What does that mean? How will that affect the rest of who we are and what we do? That's what we're learning about in Epiphany. To see what it means to have this God in human flesh show up with us. What changes does that bring for you and for me and for the world? So this is indeed a momentous time and we are grateful for God's presence and accompaniment of, of us as we walk forward into the future. So a couple of just quick announcements to give you as we begin our time together today. And that is first of all, today at 11 o'clock, well that is today if you're watching on Sunday, I'm not sure when you'll be watching, but on Sunday the 24th, we will be having the second part of our annual meeting. And at that meeting we'll be mainly talking about and passing a 2021 budget. So. If you are planning to be at that meeting, 11 o'clock is the time it starts. I think we'll open up the Zoom meeting about 10.45 or so. So tune in, be a part of it as we discuss some important things about the upcoming year. Also, uh, just a really important thing to share with you. Uh, I know for many of you uh, Elam members, uh, this uh, is a, an important thing to know about. Just this past week, uh, Harriet Johnson uh, passed away. Harriet was a longtime member of Elam, and not just a member, but somebody who was deeply involved in the life of this parish. She was an accompanist here at uh, Elam for many, many years. She was also very instrumental in helping to get the gift shop established down at the Gamble Garden. She is a woman who was uh, faithful, not only here at Elam, but lived out her deep faith in so many ways. We will indeed miss her presence with us. Keep her family in your prayers uh, in these coming weeks. So, I think that's all the announcements I need to bring to your attention now. There may be some other things on the bulletin that you can download, by the way, from our website while you are watching. Um, and um, just keep in mind uh, that here at Elam, even though we aren't able to be right here in the pews next to each other, we continue to be a church beyond the building, connected to one another. Just this past week, I learned of several members of our parish who are out visiting those who have had health issues over the last few months as we've been kept separate from one another. They've routinely gone out to visit people to share with them food, whatever it is that can be a little bit of an icebreaker and an opportunity to pray with people. Ministry continues here. We are connected, even though we're not in the same room. And so, as we prepare to worship on this day, I invite you simply to take a moment to quiet your mind, close your eyes, and take a deep breath. And so we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Will you come and follow me, but if I call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Will you leave yourself behind, but if I call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare, should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Prayer of the day. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The reading is from Jonah, chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 and 10. The Lord spoke his word to Jonah again and said, Get up, go to the great city Nineveh, and preach to it what I tell you to say. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and got up and went to Nineveh. It was a very large city. Just to walk across it took a person three days. After Jonah had entered the city and walked for one day, he preached to the people, saying, After forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God. They announced that they would stop eating for a while, and they would put on rough cloth to show their sadness. All the people in the city did this, from the most important to the least important. When God saw that the pe what the people did, that they stopped doing evil, he changed his mind and did not do what he had warned. He did not punish them. Here ends the reading. From the Gospel according to Mark, in the first chapter, starting at verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. After Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who dwells among us. Our epiphany theme is transformation. And the book of Jonah is all about transformation, though perhaps not in the places we're looking for it. The reading we have for today is just a tiny little snippet out of the story of Jonah which is actually a very short book of the Bible and, I, and very much told as a story. So I encourage you to take a moment and read the whole thing when you get a chance. But outside of the small snippet that we have for today, before this part where Jonah is going across the city proclaiming repentance, Jonah's been dragging his feet. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He tried to avoid going to Nineveh. He ended up there anyway and reluctantly shared what God wanted him to share. And why was 
Why was Jonah like this? The reason that he later on gives when he's talking to God has to do with the fact that these people are his enemies. These are the Assyrians. This is the time of the Babylonian exile. The people of Israel have been conquered and are oppressed. What Jonah wants is for God to strike these people down. He doesn't want any opportunity for repentance. And his fear is, what if God does forgive them? And Jonah's like, my head will explode if I have to, have to deal with this. And indeed, Jonah's worst fears come to pass. The people do repent, and God does forgive them. So Jonah goes outside the city and sits in the hot sun and basically pouts, and he grumbles to God. And he twists this phrase from Psalm 145 that is a a verse of praise and joy to one that he says in a sneering kind of way, saying, Everyone knows you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This doesn't make Jonah happy right now. He doesn't want it to be true for them. Because he's like, see, you'll even forgive those people over there. So what are your feelings about repentance and forgiveness? It's a part of our Christian DNA to celebrate repentance and forgiveness. But it's also a whole lot easier to be in favor of that in theory than when we're dealing with the messy reality in front of us. What does repentance look like? What is enough repentance? What is genuine repentance? What are the consequences that will befall one for a behavior, even if there is repentance and forgiveness? One of the places where we see this struggle is in our political arena. We all know the pattern. A person is running for office, and something they did 10, 20, 30 years ago is brought up and examined. And this thing is abhorrent in some way. Perhaps the person running for office wore blackface to a Halloween party when they were in college. Perhaps it has since come to light that when they worked as a prosecutor, people went to jail and prison who were actually innocent. There's hundreds of variations on this story. And what it boils down to is the, at the end of it is the person who has done this thing has three options. They can ignore what's being said and hope it just goes away, hope something more interesting pops up in the news cycle soon. They can explain it away, or at least try to explain it away, or they can publicly repent. And when the person publicly apologizes, the question is raised, what is an acceptable apology? When it happens, inevitably there are those that say, well, that was incredibly heartfelt. Of course we need to forgive this and just put it behind us. And others will say, oh, they are just doing this to appease their base. They don't really mean it. If this were the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland, it would be off with their heads. Some will say, here are 15 things I can show you that will prove that they have changed and that their mind has changed and the way they look at things is different than it was that 10, 20, 30 years ago. To which others will say, they changed their mind on on a value they held Even if it was 30 years ago, how can you trust they won't change their mind again?
And then there are those that say, well, that's all nice, but life has consequences. I would imagine that these feel familiar as the arguments that you've heard when somebody has apologized or people think they should apologize. And going back to Jonah, I can understand his frustration. As we talked about, these people are the enemy. These people defeated his people. These people are occupying the land they understand to be theirs. These are Jonah and his people have had to live in other places, pushed out, moved away. Nineveh symbolizes everything that's wrong with what's going on around them. Why should he want their repentance? Why should their repentance even matter to him and his life? <clears throat> Perhaps the story of Jonah is not so much about this miracle that we get in our text for today, this miracle of an entire city, every person, and the animals, all repenting and putting on ash cloth. I mean, it's a fantastical story. It's hard to imagine any community agreeing on anything altogether, let alone this kind of repentance. But I, I don't know that that miracle is the center of the story. I think where the story leaves us is where we are called to dwell. At the end of this story, with Jonah sitting outside in the hot sun, and eventually he gets a plant that grows and shades him, and then it dies, and then he's mad at God about that too, we're left with wondering what Jonah is going to do with this truth about his God, that he has this God that does forgive, and that that forgiveness extends even to people he hates and has reason to disagree with. And we don't know. We don't get the end of the story of what Jonah says or does after that point. The end of the story is purposely left open so that we can think and imagine ourselves as Jonah. Imagine how we would feel in his situation. To wrestle with our feelings and our faith and imagine what comes next. We're living in a time of strong feelings and intensely different points of view. There is no simple, easy answer. There is no simple way of just going, well, let's be unified, and it happens. We can't paper over the struggles and the differences and the pain that exists. All these things need to be dealt with. We've got work ahead of us, all of us. We aren't going to get that quick transformation that the Ninevites experienced. Instead, we're on a journey like Jonah, and we're being called to go deep within ourselves. And we know as we do this deep, scary journey that God is with us, just as God was with Jonah from beginning to end in the story that God remains in conversation with us as we struggle, as we struggle with that concept of reconciling ourselves with others. This is the every single day work that we're going to need to do to claim the truth about God with the joy that it is spoken about in Psalm 145. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I want to take a moment to thank all of you. This is our generosity moment. 
for all of those who have been giving and supporting us financially, for all those that are reaching out and taking care of their neighbor right now. Thank you for all the ways that you continue to be community, a community of generosity here at Elam Lutheran. Thank you. together our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you now to join me as we pray together the prayers that bring us before God, that lift the prayers of the community. We ask that maybe even during the time when we are apart, maybe more so now, that the prayers of your heart are things that, as you're able, to be able to talk with other people around you. Whether it's a family member or a friend, it's important to have someone to share with, someone that you know hears your prayers. The reason we pray as a people is not just to hear one another, but to be reminded that God hears your prayer. And so, together, we pray on this day. Gracious God, you have led us as your people through a trying time of COVID pandemic, of upheaval in our nation, and you have in and through it all promised to walk with us and to continue to be present. Lord, on this day, we give you thanks for your unending faithfulness to us that brings us to this day. Lord, bring us together in your presence. All people are your people. All people, all nations belong to you. And it is in that reality we trust and hope this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray on this day for the gift of your bountiful creation, for the land which in this season rests beneath a blanket of snow, for the life and beauty that nevertheless fills the world around us. We give you thanks and praise 
Teach us to care for your world in ways that provide sustainable life for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Trinity, one God, you show us the splendor of diversity and the beauty of unity in your own divine life. Make us, who came from many nations and with many languages, make us a united people that delights in our many different gifts. Defend our liberties and give those whom we have entrusted with authority the spirit of wisdom, that there might be justice in our land and that we may be at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Deliver us, O Lord, from the cowardice that dare not face new truth, from the laziness that is contented with half-truth, and from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healer of our every ill, we pray this day for all who are in need of healing, whether in body, mind, or spirit. This day we remember those from our own community, Denise, Taylor, John, and Chris. We ask that you would surround and comfort them by your Spirit, and we lift also before you those who are grieving, especially the families of the more than 406,000 people who have died from COVID-19 in our country. We pray, too, that you would hold and surround the families of Harriet Johnson and Lois Venowitz. Keep them in your care. Surround them with your spirit and give them your grace and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear all the prayers of your people this day, whether spoken out loud or silently in our hearts. Give ear to your people now as we pray together the prayer which you taught us to pray.
Now, as we leave this worship time, we go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.